Hello friends, it's The Stitches, and my hair is different. I'm sure many of you have noticed that I've been having a lot of fun playing with some darker alternative outfits. I've been wearing primarily pastels and bright colors for a long while now, but a couple years ago I started to add the occasional black garment or darker color. Just sort of seeing if I had an actual interest in wearing all black and fishnet again, or if I was just reliving some inner 13 year old emo angst. And after a little bit of minor experimentation, I realized, oh shoot, I do want to break out my seven year old spike collection again. So over the past year or so, I've been working on this video. No, really, it's been over a year. <laughs> I guess that's why they call it slow fashion. I do want to stress though that I'm not getting rid of my pastel clothes and ditching my old style. This video is more about creating a wardrobe that I can wear in addition to my regular style. So let's talk about the process of building a new wardrobe. I've made a few videos about building wardrobes in the past, so I'm not going to get too nitty gritty, but my method can basically be summed up in three steps. Step one, get inspiration and figure out what you enjoy wearing. Step two, determine the essential basics and design elements that make up your style. And step three, slowly acquire what you need. So let's just begin with step one. Before we even begin to think about buying things, we need to know what to buy, because I actually do want to approach this with something resembling a strategy. In order to know what to buy though, we first have to actually define the style I'm going for. I've purposefully avoided calling it anything specific because like, it's not really goth, but it's also not really intended to be punk. It's also kind of emo, but only a little, not really. There are certainly visual K influences, but I wouldn't put it in the visual K tag. It's also very preppy, and there are a lot of menswear elements, a lot of sweaters. Since my style doesn't fit into any one single category, I can't exactly just pull up a how to dress goth tutorial, because what they tell me to buy isn't necessarily going to be what I want to wear. That means I'm going to have to figure out my own basics, which means I'm going to have to do some research, because I really needed another excuse to waste hours on Pinterest. I ended up saving over 300 photos of outfits I liked. Some of them were street snaps, some of them were runway looks, some of them were editorial spreads, some of them were blogger selfies. I just wanted to find a good variety of looks that encapsulated the general aesthetic I was going for. From that pool of images, I narrowed it down to my top 30 or so. So what was left were only the outfits that I really liked and felt really inspired by. From here, I was able to more clearly find a style that, while it doesn't fit into any one specific box, it feels more genuine to me and feels like something I would actually enjoy wearing comfortably. I don't want to solely rely on Pinterest though. Seeing an outfit on someone else is not the same as wearing it yourself. While finding inspirational looks from outside sources, I also noted what I already have and what I already wear. Whenever I wind up really liking an outfit, I take a photo of it. I don't always post every outfit I take a photo of, but keeping track of what I actually like to wear will help me figure out what I naturally gravitate towards. So after I've recorded all of these outfits and analyzed them, now that I have a strong sense of what my style even is, we can move on to step two. After defining my overall style, it's easier to pick up on those individual details that really define outfits that I like. For instance, how garments are layered or how outfits are accessorized. From here, I was able to generate a list of basics that I'll need as well as statement pieces that can really elevate my looks. So I literally took a pen and some paper and wrote out what types of tops I need, what types of layering pieces, what types of bottoms, accessories, all of that. Everything a wardrobe in this style would require so if I were to own, say, a week or two worth of outfits, what items would I need to make those outfits? Because I'm extra and YouTube is a visual medium, I like to take this a step further and take that list and organize it into a table, where the columns are different types of garments and the rows are the different colors that I need those garments in. This creates a table where each square represents a garment that I need to fulfill a specific role in my wardrobe. Obviously, I don't need every basic in every color, so if I don't intend on buying it, I'll just scribble it out. The table I'm showing you is actually finished and represents 
everything I have at the end of this video, but you get the general idea, and if you don't, I've made a whole video explaining this concept in the past. Now that I have my basics list, I can go through my wardrobe and write down anything that fills a square on that table. Normally this would also be a good time to pull out clothes that no longer fit, or pull out clothes that you just don't see yourself wearing in the future, and finding a new home for those items. But I literally just made a video doing that, so we're gonna kind of gloss over that step. So now we have finally made it to step three, the actually fun step. I'm first going to show you the items that I already had because the most sustainable garment is one that's already in your wardrobe or however the saying goes. So starting off, I've had this chiffon skirt for a number of years. You've probably already seen it. This stretchy lingerie top, I've also had a couple years. I stole this Bauhaus t-shirt from my husband, but it's okay because I introduced him to Bauhaus. This shirt was gifted from Puvithel. A basic black thrifted sweater. Another solid black sweater, but slightly baggier. This solid black sweater is actually a dress. We're kind of reaching with this one, but I found these two pieces separately and they're both black and white houndstooth, so I like to pretend they're a set. My Dior blazer that I thrifted. I actually made a whole video about this enchanted scissors one piece. A vintage red velvet dress. And of course, I already have literal armloads of pastel basics that I've been collecting for several years and can use to mix and match. So to summarize, I have one skirt, no pants, three tops, one kind of fancy tank top and two graphic tees, three basic black sweaters, two blazers with bonus extra skirt, and two dresses. Now that we've established what I don't need to buy, we'll create a shopping list out of the remaining basics that I need. But I didn't want to just run to Depop and buy everything that I needed all at once. At this point, I was still in a moderately experimental place with this whole process, so I didn't want to waste a bunch of money on clothes I wound up not liking, or that didn't fit, or just didn't wind up working for some reason, and then I had to figure out what to do with them after. So instead I added new pieces gradually, starting with one or two just essential items, and then after experimenting with them a bit and being sure that I was ready for new pieces, I would go back to my list and pick out a couple new items. So everything that I wound up buying either came from a physical thrift store locally, or from Depop. I tried to find what I could locally first because, frankly, it's just more affordable to do it that way, but there were some items that I wound up really struggling to find locally, so I wound up purchasing those off of Depop. And of course, there were a couple really neat things that I found while browsing on Depop that I bought because I wanted them. So here is everything that I wound up purchasing. A cropped tee with lettuce hems, a strappy crop top for layering over stuff, an evening wear top you guys have actually seen before. You may not believe me, but this bodice is actually from Gunny Sacks. For layering, I got some basic button-ups in black, white, and pastel pink. I also found a couple statement button-ups. These were both 99 cents. Sheer layering tops were all over my Pinterest, so I got this one. And I feel like this might have been a beach cover-up, but I'm going to use this for layering as well. And of course, we're all contractually obligated to own the same Joy Division merch. The slightest hint of Joy Division just makes me want to like vomit and run out of the room. I got this zigzag sweater at a local thrift store. And here's another true vintage piece. I adore the weird little sleeve detail. Another piece I passed by a few times before it went on final sale for 99 cents. Kind of a theme there. Obligatory big long cardigan, but in black. Some black and white gingham pants. And some baggy plaid pants. I literally just didn't have a single pair of decent shorts, so I just needed shorts. A basic black skirt with some pleating in the back. And then finally a little plaid skirt. In summation, I bought four tops, two kind of casual summer tops, and three more fancy evening wear pieces, five button-ups, which feels like so many, but I'll have tons of layering options now, two sheer layering tops, three statement sweaters, one graphic crew neck, and two geometric sweaters, a couple miscellaneous pieces of knitwear, three bottoms, two pants and one pair of shorts, and finally two skirts. This certainly feels like a massive shopping spree when we pool everything together like this, but realistically this represents like over a year of shopping. In addition to buying things, I also wanted to make a few things for my wardrobe because I'm me and obviously I just wanted to. So while I was thrifting, I kept my eye out for basic black garments that I could upcycle. So now we're gonna get into some actual projects, but first I have been talking forever now, so let's have a commercial break. 
All right, we are back. Maybe we didn't go anywhere. Let's do some crafting. When you buy solid black items from the thrift store, it's very likely that they're going to have at least a little bit of fading. So I purposefully tried to buy pieces that were 100% cotton so that it would be easy to re-dye them. There's definitely a learning curve to dyeing at home, but just touching up the black dye on a cotton shirt is pretty simple. First, I need to completely saturate the garments with water, the hottest water that my tap will put out. Pre-soaking the clothes allows the dye to saturate them more evenly. I'm just using basic writ dye. Something a lot of people don't seem to realize is that writ dye is actually supposed to be boiled. I don't want to have fabric dye anywhere near my kitchen, and I don't have one of those portable burners, so I'm using water that I've heated to boiling on my stove. Most dyes will still work with room temperature water, but the color won't come out as rich or dark, and the black writ dye tends to just come out brown if you don't use any heat. After my dye is mixed, I'll add my wet clothes, and once the clothes are fully submerged, it needs to soak for at least 20 minutes. Normally, I would let the dye sit longer, especially if I was using cold water, but we only needed to touch up a few shirts. Overall, I did these three shirts, which we'll use for the next couple projects. I've been wanting to add some graphic tees to my wardrobe just in general. So when I found this old top from Eyeshadow that has a hood and a front pocket, I knew I had to do something with it. So I dipped into my embellishments box and found something that may be familiar to some of you. Back when I still bought fast fashion, I got an Esther Kim Bunny graphic tee from WC, and I actually did a small haul of the items that I got on this channel. But the original shirt, being fast fashion, has since completely disintegrated. But the screen printing itself was in decent enough condition, so I just carefully trimmed the worn out fabric away from the graphic and just saved it so that I could patch it onto something else later. I pinned the patch onto the shirt roughly where I wanted it and then simply gave it a zigzag stitch around the edges to hold it in place. I would normally do more to finish it, but this is a knit that's coated in heavy screen printing ink, so I'm not really worried about fraying. We've started out with my least dramatic upcycle project, but this piece was honestly already so cool on its own that I didn't really want to change it up a ton. Here's another t-shirt that I got for upcycling. It's actually a very nice heavy rib knit. I want to lengthen the sleeves with fabric inserts, so we'll use a ruler and mark an inch up from the hem. The hem itself is an inch thick already, so we'll have a nice solid band of black at the bottom of the sleeve. And I'll set my cuff pieces aside for now. Now I need to figure out how long I want my inserts. I'm measuring from the bottom of the remaining sleeve to the tips of my fingers. I want to make the sleeve extra long so I can partake in this Slender Man but make it punk trend that's happening right now because I've become obsessed and I genuinely like it when sleeves are a little bit too long so this just takes it to the next level. I also need to measure how wide the sleeve inserts need to be to fit the original. I'm using some scrap fabric to build my inserts. The pink fabric is left over from the sports bear dress that I recently upcycled and the purple has been in my stash for a few years now so I'm not too sure what I originally had it for. I made my pieces the same width as the garment sleeve with a tiny bit of seam allowance for the serger, and to get my overall length I divided the length of the arm by five since I wanted five insert panels and then I rounded up to the nearest inch, adding a little smidge so my sleeves wind up extending well past my hands. The final rectangle you wind up with should be wider than it is long. I need ten panels total, five for each sleeve in alternating colors. Each panel is folded in on itself, right sides together, and pinned in place along the short edge. Next I took all these little pieces over to the serger and stitched along the pinned edge. This creates the seam that runs down the length of the arm. Then I'm going to pin our now two pieces in alternating colors right sides together and stitch them in place. Remember that we need two sets of five stitched together. Then on the bottom of our finished sleeve inserts we'll attach the hem from our original shirt. To finish the sleeves, our tubes are then set into the original sleeve on our garment. Here's a look at our shirt so far. I'm absolutely obsessed with how fun the extra long sleeves are. As tempting as it might be to call it good here though, I want to paint the front of my shirt with something that takes this even further into the creepy cute territory. So now it's time to pull out some fabric paint. Painting on black fabric can be kind of tricky, so it helps to put down a solid base of white first to act as a primer before adding any color. After I'm done painting, the shirt needs to rest for a couple days to finish drying before I can heat set the paint with an iron. 
So here's a quick reminder of what we started out with, just a simple tee made from really lovely material, and we turned it into this creepy cute too long sleeved graphic tee. Now we're moving on to the very last shirt. This is a basic v-neck long sleeve. I like the cozy fit, so we'll just be painting and embellishing this one. The pink knit fabric is actually some extra from a secret project that I'm working on. I'm just going to cut two sets of three hearts to make six total. Next I'll flatten the sleeves on my garment and pin the hearts down in a layout that sort of mimics the heart sleeves that literally every J Fashion brand put out in like 2018. Now I'm just using my machine's knit stitch to secure these, and I'm sure you're noticing how non-aesthetic the process of adding embellishments to a finished sleeve is. I tried to very carefully measure and center my graphic so it wouldn't look lopsided, but I quickly realized that the center point of the v-neck is not centered on the shirt, so I had to fiddle with the placement a bit before laying down any actual paint. The teddy bear design is based off of a painting I made a while back that actually appears in one of my zines. I decided to make it the subject of a sort of playing card design. Once again, we've started with a very simple basic garment that we thrifted and re-dyed, and now we have another adorable top that is equal parts cute and comfortable. I've mentioned punk influences, and we all know that no punk wardrobe is complete without a patch-encrusted jacket. Punk jackets tend to be made out of either leather or denim, but leather and denim jackets are such universal basics that when you do find them at the thrift store, they tend to either be higher priced, or they're very worn out and not in very good condition. But you don't have to make a punk jacket out of denim or leather, you can use any kind of jacket. And as an example, I actually find blue lasers at thrift stores all the time. People buy them specifically for an event or an interview, and then in between events and interviews, their size changes. I try to avoid buying business wear that's too nice or too formal, because I try to leave them for people that actually need work or interview clothes. But this particular one that I found at a thrift store isn't super nice or super fancy, so I don't really mind turning it into edgy clown clothes. Nothing says, hey, please don't touch me, quite like covering yourself in spikes. So I counted out the number of silver toned cone spikes that I had and marked out placements for them. These are the screwing kind, so I simply have to open up a hole using an awl, insert the screw through the bottom of the fabric, and twist on the spike. Now I can happily pretend to be a porcupine. I wanted to add a little chain detail to the lapel and fake pocket bit to play off the idea of a watch chain, but since I don't use an old school watch and the pocket isn't even real, we'll permanently install it using jewelry findings. I'll use a pair of jump rings to attach the chain. I'm using two just for the extra support. Now I want to attach the other end of this chain to an oversized safety pin. We'll use a pair of jump rings for that as well. The safety pin attaches to the lapel to create a draped effect with the chain. Now I'll turn my attention to these heinous buttons. I know a lot of people love the military look, but I don't, so I'm replacing the single front button with this vintage gumdrop looking one. The original button was actually only held on by one single thread, so it wasn't too difficult to remove. There were also three buttons on each sleeve, or there were supposed to be anyway, but I'll just remove those. Next we'll add a chain detail to the back of the blazer as well, so I'll need some hardware to attach the chain to. The D-rings are sewn to the shoulders, and then again I'll use a pair of jump rings to attach the chain. At this point we're ready to break the fabric paint back out. I was really stumped on what to use as a back patch, so my husband actually helped me design this particular piece. And here you can see the actual heat set process. I use a scrap of muslin for a press cloth, and I typically wait at least a day or two after the paint is dry to prevent sticking, although it usually does still stick a little bit. And I just continued making patches. I have several odd bits of denim scraps, so this is a good way to use them up. I didn't make so many that the whole jacket is coated in a layer of patchwork, but I at least wanted a good amount of patch coverage. Of everything I did for this video, painting all of these little patches was the most tedious and time-consuming, so don't expect this to be an overnight process. 
Once my patches were finished and heat set, I arranged them on my jacket with pins before stitching them down. I also added multiple enamel pins and pin back buttons. Once I felt happy with the jacket, I was ready to sew. I'm using just basic solid black thread for all the patches on this jacket. You can also use a contrast color to add a cool detail or even embroidery floss. I'm using a basic whip stitch. You could just use a sewing machine, but this jacket has a lining. And when you put a lining in a blazer, you usually make the lining just a little bit bigger so it has wiggle room. And that kind of makes it easier to move around in, so I don't want to ruin that effect. So I'm carefully stitching the patches on without catching the lining fabric. To remind you of how this looked before, here is the jacket without any of my embellishments. And here it is now. I just really like having a big jacket that goes with everything. Now moving on, I have this pink denim vest I'd like to work on. I somehow forgot to film a before, but it only had the pins on the front and some shoulder patches, and I honestly never even gave it a back patch. This denim vest is actually one of the oldest pieces in my wardrobe. I just wanted to give it a quick refresh and give it a back patch. I wanted to do a swan design based on the Ugly Duckling because it's one of my favorite fairy tales. In addition to a back patch, I just wanted a couple extra patches for the sides. This one says, Who Made Your Clothes? in reference to the Fashion Revolution campaign. I also took all the original pins off the jacket and did some rearranging, and added some spikes to the back of the vest when originally it just had them on the front. But apparently I didn't film that part. So here's my before, I guess. I've actually changed this vest up multiple times and it was originally black when I bought it over five years ago. But here it is now. More patches, more spikes. It doesn't look like a terribly dramatic change for this garment either, but I mostly just wanted it to feel fresh and new so I'm more likely to reach for it. Now we're gonna move on from jackets and work on some pants, but before we do that, we're gonna have a quick commercial break. All right, pals, let's talk pants. This was a superbly lucky thrift store find, especially since it was only 99 cents. I wish they weren't quite so low rise, but I can live with it on account of the black and purple gingham. To be honest, these jeans aren't in the best condition or else I would have left them as is, but there's some sort of adhesive stain that needs to be covered up with a patch, so while I'm at it, I want to make a bigger patch to go on the leg as well. To get the general shape of the leg, I'll use some scrap paper and make a pattern. Then I'll use that pattern to cut and serge a piece of denim with a little bit of wiggle room on the sides. I originally made this teddy bear pattern for something else entirely, but it's in my pattern stash, so I'm using it. Originally, I used a fabric pen and drew a fairly simple bear, but later on I went back and painted over it and made it more colorful. Back to the actual pants, you can better see that adhesive spot. Since I'm already altering them and I only have a small handful of this type of spike left in my stash, I'm going to use them to stud the practically non-existent pockets. I used a measuring tape and a chalk pencil to mark out where my studs needed to go. And now we have pockets, but with 50% more edge. Now for that glue spot. I know you guys were very upset with me for removing the bunnies on that one cardigan, so here's a bunny going on some pants instead. As for the teddy bear, I actually want to try the pants on to figure out where to put it. I just used black embroidery floss to stitch the patches to the pants, mostly while watching YouTube. As usual, we have the pants before and the pants after. Again, not a crazy dramatic transformation, but I mostly just wanted to cover up that glue stain and not have one singular patch on the hip just looking all weird by itself. Now we're moving on to the last garment project, which is this pair of black skinny jeans. For this project, I mostly wanted to distress the knees so I could layer them over tights or fishnets for a cool effect, and I also wanted to use up this last little bit of black denim scraps that I had left over from the patch making. Since the two black fabrics were so different, they needed a buffer fabric between them to keep them from looking so off, so I used some scraps left over from shortening that houndstooth skirt that I showed you earlier, which I actually did in a previous video. As I'm sure you've noticed, sewing patches onto finished pant legs is even less aesthetic than sleeves. So here it is tried on. The thread ends still need to be trimmed, but it looks pretty good. 
Now that the patches are secure, I'm marking out the knees so I know where to distress. I'm just going to cut the middle of the knee out entirely, leaving an inch or so from where I want to start distressing. Then I'll take my seam ripper, pulling apart the threads from the edge of the fabric to the line I marked. The idea is to leave the vertical thread intact while pulling out the horizontal ones, leaving a frayed edge. I actually showed you how to do this exact process on the aforementioned skirt. To keep the pants from fraying further in the wash, I'll set my machine to a very narrow straight stitch and create a row of stitching along the edge of the knee holes I've created. We started out with a basic pair of thrift store jeans, and now we have moderately cooler thrift store jeans. Now that we're finished with garments, let's move on to accessories. When it comes to alternative fashion, accessories do a surprising amount of heavy lifting. But personally, I don't like owning a bunch of random things for no reason. So I wanted to create a collection of accessories that really pull the look together without me needing to own a million of them. Some of the first items I got for pulling it together edgier looks was legwear. I didn't buy anything new specifically for this video, so you've actually seen all of my socks and tights before. So next we have shoes. Overall, I've been pretty dissatisfied with my collection of shoes just in general, and recently I've also had a few pairs break down, so I actually got quite a few new pairs to make up for that. Let's start with this pair of red velvet tuck creepers that I got secondhand a while ago now, and I loved them so much I wanted another pair in another color, so I got the black suede version from a consignment shop. Then I got this pair of faux suede platform boots. This white pair has quickly become a wardrobe staple. Then this last pair is definitely my favorite. I finally got some lavender shoes. And my lavender shoes were actually a DIY project, so let's switch back over into crafting mode. For the next couple projects, I need some products. Some leather preparer for stripping off the original surface, an extra large bottle of white leather paint for using as a base coat, smaller bottles of leather paint in my desired colors, as well as a matte finishing glaze. The shoes were originally pink. I bought them thinking they would be more bubblegum, but they're more of a peachy pink, and I actually already have a pair of shoes that were the exact same color. I suppose I could have painted them bubblegum pink like I originally wanted, but I wanted lavender shoes even more, and lavender shoes are much harder to find secondhand, at least from my experience, so we'll use this as a glass half full situation and make the harder to find colorway. After stripping off the original finish, I taped over the parts of the shoe that I didn't want to get painted. I'm just using basic painter's tape. Since I have a big area to cover and only a little bottle of my lavender paint, I'll put down a couple layers of white paint to act as a primer so I can use fewer layers of lavender. Now that the original color is covered, we just need to coat it with enough lavender to be opaque, which only ended up being two coats. After letting the shoes dry for a couple days, I stripped off the tape. There were some spots that needed a quick touch up with a detail brush, and afterwards I coated the shoes in that matte finishing glaze. After the glaze is dry, the shoes are done. I let the paint set for a couple weeks before wearing them outdoors, though. There was one other project that I wanted to paint as well. I wanted a small purse for everyday use that worked better with darker outfits, so I nabbed this leather shoulder bag from a thrift store for $1.99. It's just a simple brown bag, it may not look like much, but I want to create a color block effect by painting the front panels different colors from the rest of the bag. Once again, after we strip off the original surface, I'll apply paint. I'm just applying some black paint directly to the body of the bag, leaving the front panels untouched. The paint actually covered up the leather pretty easily and only needed a couple coats. Then I covered the front flap with the same lavender as before. I'm not using a base coat because these panels are honestly so small that I'm not too worried about needing to add a couple extra coats. And as I said with the black, the paint actually did a good job covering up the surface of the bag. And I only needed a couple coats of the other paints as well, surprisingly. So I already have this pastel pink paint, but I honestly wasn't a fan of this shade as it's too warm for my wardrobe. So instead of using the pastel shade that I already have, I'm taking a tiny bit of this darker cool toned hot pink and mixing it with white to create a new cool toned pastel. This covered the front panel underneath the lavender flap. After some dry time, we'll cover up the front flap with some painter's tape so I can paint over the tiniest panel that I've yet to touch. This one I'm just covering with solid white. After the paint is dry, we'll finish the leather portions of the bag with finishing gloss. 
As cool as this bag already looks, I wasn't a fan of the brass hardware and brown zipper. So the fabric portion of the zipper I painted with white fabric paint. Next we'll use a couple products that I'm not sure I recommend, but I used them. All I could find locally for a hardened surface paint was glass paint, and I think next time I would actually bother to do some searching on the internet to find something specifically for painting on metal. The button snap on the front of the bag held up fine, but the zipper pull definitely needed touch-ups after a couple uses. I didn't originally use the triple thick since it's not exactly my favorite hard gloss in the world, but the zipper especially needed it. I painted the zipper teeth very sparsely with the glass paint, and I didn't paint in between the teeth really at all because I didn't want to mess with the zipper, but it worked fairly well, and if I need to touch it up now and again, I'm not too mad about that as long as the zipper is still functional. My little color block purse isn't exactly perfect, but I absolutely love it and it works for what I wanted it for. Now the only accessories we have left to discuss are jewelry. Jewelry can be super easy to make, especially the kinds of items that I want. I made all but a couple of these pieces myself, but I don't exactly consider myself to be a jewelry making expert. So I didn't film the process and I'm just going to give you sort of a rough explanation of how I put everything together. One item that was all over my Pinterest were these chunky o-ring necklaces, so I had to have one. This is actually a welding ring that you can get from the hardware store for like a dollar. They're kept in the same places as like the screws and nuts and bolts. It's just attached with jump rings to this extra chunky chain that I got from a standard crafting store. And then I just have this big clasp in the back. I also really like locks. This heart one I actually got from Depop. I got one that I was sure was secondhand though because there are a lot of people drop shipping locks that look just like this one. This other lock necklace I made with a hardware store lock, just a tiny little brass one that I found. I just put a basic closure on some chain and then threaded it through the lock when it was open. This next piece I made by just using jump rings to connect some safety pins. If you're afraid of the pins popping open, you could just take your pliers and pinch the opening together so that the pin is permanently shut. For this last little choker, I took the rest of those heart connectors that I used in the stuffed animal bag video and some jump rings and just some little scrap of chain and made a new chain all together using all those little pieces. Then it closes with this heart clasp. I also saw many variations of pocket chains in my Pinterest album, so I made one using this super chunky chain again, and a couple more of these welding rings. I also made this faux pearl pocket chain for my more pastel wardrobe, using a vintage necklace that I thrifted for like a dollar a couple years ago now I think, but it was aging really badly so I took it apart and used the beads to make a couple things. Then I used this case to store a few other little bits and bobs, but I really wanted to downsize my accessories since I don't really wear that much jewelry normally, and I like to be able to fit all of my jewelry, even the big oversized stuff, in this one little tackle box-esque divider. It's actually made for jewelry specifically to be tarnish proof, but I don't know if I actually really believe that's true, I just appreciated that I was able to find it locally for less than $10. At this point, I think it's safe to say that I'm done acquiring things for a good long while. This feels like more than enough to me now, and I'm really excited to show you some outfits that I can put together with all of these things that I just showed you. I only put together 10 coordinates today, but I feel like I have a pretty endless number of outfits that I can create now. Especially when you use all of these darker pieces in combination with my pastel basics. So let's look at some outfits. We'll start with a more classically romantic goth look. The Scunny Sacks bodice can easily be worn on its own, but it also looks amazing over a sheer top, so I've paired it with that mesh long sleeve. I think the lighter fabrics really pair nicely with the high quality satin that the bodice is made out of. To match the red on the bodice, I've used the red pair of Tuck Creepers, which unfortunately film darker than they are in real life. I also like mixing the heavier chain jewelry with the pearls. I think it looks really interesting. For the second look, I've combined that Joy Division crew neck with my Baby the Star Shine Bright blouse, and again I've mixed heavy industrial chain jewelry with more dainty pearls. I've also matched the pearl necklace to the pearl pant chain. To keep the black and off-white color scheme, I've also used the black and white gingham pants. And then I've matched my shoes to my purse, creating a fun little pop of lavender. 
Next, we have a slightly more casual outfit. The pink on this Puvathol shirt perfectly matches the Peter Pan collar shirt. It seems like it used to be part of a pajama set, but I wasn't about to pass up the quilted satin on the collar and cuffs. Since it is a pajama shirt though, it's deceptively comfortable, and to extend the extreme comfort of this outfit, I used the loose plaid pants. I can't quite explain why I love this next look so much, but I do. The purple gingham pants don't quite match the blazer, but they work well enough with each other that I enjoy pairing them. The hooded t-shirt and big platform boots may or may not result in an overall look that seems to be aesthetically confused, but at least it seems to be a cute confusion. This next look has gone in a much preppier direction. I feel like this outfit is most like my usual everyday style, but just in black. I love a big oversized top with a pleated skirt, hence why I have so many pleated skirts. The pink on the teddy bear playing card shirt pairs perfectly with this vintage silk scarf. Basic white tights and black creepers keep the look simple. I feel like these looks are just exposing how much I love blazers. I know you guys are mostly aware of my love for vintage sweaters, but I'm also obsessed with blazers apparently. Since I like to pair this houndstooth blazer with my houndstooth skirt, and I used the fabric from the skirt on these jeans, I figured the blazer would also pair with the jeans nicely as well. The jeans also layer nicely over some wide fishnet tights. Returning to a more simple look next, I've paired the rotten shirt with a button-up. I'm using my black pleated skirt, and I've just turned it to the side a little bit, so more of the pleating is visible in the front. This way I can almost pretend that it's a kilt. Once again, I've chosen simple white tights, but this time I'm matching the purple on my sleeve with the lavender platform Mary Janes. For this next look, big shocker, I've paired an oversized top with a pleated skirt because I'm very predictable. I didn't have a turtleneck and skirt combo that perfectly matched, but both of these pinks are cool toned and they're different enough that I feel like they don't clash terribly. Then on my legs, I've layered white fishnets over black stockings and of course the platform boots needed to make another appearance. I swear, this is the last outfit that includes a pleated skirt. For the base of this outfit, I just have my black tank top paired with the plaid skirt. Then over that, I've layered the mesh hoodie, and then over that, I have my pink denim vest. In order to give my outfit a bit of a better silhouette, I took a big safety pin and bunched up the fabric on one side to create a gathered effect. For my final look, I've decided to go a bit more over the top and broke out a few more statement pieces. You've probably seen my thrift flip video in which I made this dress, and you guys seem to be just as confused by the embroidery as I was. But let's face it, the less a garment makes sense, the more I love it. I couldn't resist pairing the red teddy bear bag with the sports bear dress, even if the reds clash. You probably also recognize the bag. As much fun as it is to show you all these outfits, this really is just a small sampling of all the looks I could put together using all of the items that I just showed you. However, this video is getting a bit long and I feel like it's high time we wrapped this up. I really hope that it won't be several months before the next time I have another video for you guys. But huge thank you to everyone who has stuck around even in my absence. And also, like, a huge thank you for 100,000 subscribers. I still plan on doing the Q&A I mentioned in the community tab. I still have all of your questions, even the ones that were asked over on Instagram. So that will be my next video whenever that winds up coming out. And I also have a slightly secret project that my Instagram followers are actually helping me out with. So if you remember that prompt that I left in my stories and you responded to it, don't worry, that's that video is still happening. Anyway, that's all for today. Thank you all for sticking around. I hope everyone has a good day and I'll see you all next time. Bye!